Fighting the Western Front, pages 99 to 123. There are rumors of an offensive. We go up to the front two days earlier than usual. On the way, we pass a shelled schoolhouse. Stack up, stacked up against its longer side is a high double wall of yellow, unpolished, brand new coffins. They still smell of resin and pine in the forest. There are at least a hundred. That's a good preparation for the off offensive, says Mueller, astonished. There for us, growls Dietering. Don't talk rot, says Cat to him angrily. You be thankful if you get so much as a coffin, grins Chodden. They'll slip you up. They'll slip you a waterproof sheet for your old Aunt Sally of a carcass. The others jest to unpleasant jests, but what else can a man do? The coffins are, are really for us. The organization surpasses itself in that kind of thing. Page one hundred. Ahead of us, everything is shimmering. The first night we try to get our bearings. When it is fairly quiet, we can hear the transports behind the enemy lines rolling ceaselessly until dawn. Cat says that they do not go back, but are bringing up troops, troops, munitions, and guns. The English artillery has been strengthened. That we can detect at once. There are at least four more batteries of nine-inch guns to the right of the farm, and behind the poplars they have put in trench mortars. Beside these, they have brought up a number of those little French beasts with instantaneous fuses. We are now low in spirits. After we have been in the dugouts two hours, our own shells begin to fall in the trench. This is the third time in four weeks. If it were simply a mistake in aim, no one would say anything. But the truth is that the barrels are worn out. The, sh the shots are often so uncertain that they land within our own lines. Tonight, two of our men were wounded by them. Page 101. The front is a cage in which we must await fearfully whatever may happen. We lie under the network of arching shells and live in a suspense of uncertainty. Over us, chance hovers. If a shot comes, we can duck. That is all. We neither know nor can determine where it will fall. It is this chance that makes us indifferent. A few months ago, I was sitting in a dugout playing scat. After a while, I stood up and went to visit some friends in another dugout. On my return, nothing more was to be seen of the first one. It had been blown to pieces by a direct hit. I went back to the second and arrived just in time to lend a hand digging it out. In the interval, it had been buried. It is just as much a matter of chance that I am still alive as that I might have been hit. In a bomb-proof dugout, I may be smashed to, to a t atoms, and in the open may survive ten hours bombardment unscathed. No soldier outlives a thousand chances, but every soldier believes in chance and trusts his luck. We must look out for our, br for our bread. The rats have become much more numerous lately. Because the trenches are no longer in good condition. Dietering says it's a sure sign of a coming bombardment. The rats here are particularly repulsive. They are so fat, the kind we all call corpse rats. They, they have shocking, evil, naked faces, and it is nauseating to see their long, nude tails. They seem to be mighty hungry. Almost every man has, his bread, has had his bread gnawed. Crop wrapped his in a waterproof sheet and put it under his head, but he cannot sleep because they run over his face to get at it. Dietering meant to outwit them. He fastened a thin wire to the roof and suspended his bread from it. During the night when he switched on his pocket torch, he saw the wire swinging to and fro. On the bread was a riding, was riding a fat rat. At last we put a stop to it. We cannot afford to throw the bread away, because then we should have nothing left to eat in the morning. So we carefully cut off the bits of bread that the animals have gnawed. The slices we cut off are heaped together in the middle of the floor. Each man takes out his spade and lies down, prepared to strike. Dietering, Crop, and Cat hold their pocket torches ready. After a few minutes, we hear the first shuffling and tugging. It grows. Now it is the sound of many little feet. Then the torches switch on, and every man strikes at the heap, which scatters with a rush. 
The result is good. We, to we toss the bits of rat over the parapet and again lie in wait. Several times we repeat the process. At last the beasts get wise to it, or perhaps they have scented the blood. They return no more. Nevertheless, before morning, the remainder of the bread and the floor has been carried off. In the adjoining sector, they attacked two large cats and a dog, bit them to death, and devoured them. Next day, there was an issue of Edamer cheese. Each man gets almost a quarter of a cheese. In one way, that is all to the good, for Edamer is tasty, but another way it is vile, because the fat red balls have been because the fat red balls have long been a sign of a bad time coming. Our forebodings increase as rum is served out. We drink it, of course, but are not greatly comforted. During the day, we loaf about. During the day, we loaf about and make war on the rats. Ammunition and hand grenades become more plentiful. We overhaul the bayonets, that is to say, the ones that we have a saw on the blunt edge. If the fellows over there catch a man with one of those, he's killed at sight. In the, se in the next sector, some of our men were found whose noses were cut off and their eyes poked out with their own saw, saw bayonets. Their mouths and noses were stuffed with sawdust so that they suffocated. Some of the recruits have bayonets of this sort. Page 104. We take them away and give them the ordinary kind. But the bayonet has practically lost its importance. It is usually the fashion now to charge with bombs and spades only. The sharpened spade is a more handy and many-sided weapon. Not only can it be used for jabbing a man under the chin, but it is much better for striking with because of its greater weight. And if one hits between, gosh, and if one hits between the neck and shoulder, it easily cleaves as far down as the chest. The bayonet frequently jams on the thrust, and then a man has to kick hard on the other fellow's belly to pull it out again, and in the interval he may easily get one himself. And what's more, the blade often gets broken off. At night they send over gas. We expect the attack to follow and lie with our masks on, ready to tear them off as soon as the first shadow appears. Dawn approaches without anything happening, only the everlasting, nerve-wracking roll behind the enemy lines. Trains, trains, lorries, lorries. But what are they concentrating? Our artillery fires on it continually. But still, it does not cease. We have tired faces and avoid each other's eyes. It will be like the Somme, says Cat gloomily. There we were shelled steadily for two, seven days and nights. Cat has lost all his fun since we have been here, which is bad, for Cat is an old front, front hog and can smell what is coming. Page 105. Only Chodden seems pleased with the good rations and the rum. He thinks we might even go back to rest without anything happening at all. It almost looks like it. Day after day passes. At night, I squat in the listening post. Above me, the rockets and parachute lights shoot up and float down again. I am cautious and tense, but my heart thumps. My eyes turn again and again to the luminous dial of my watch. The hands will not budge. Sleep hangs on my eyelids. I work my toes in my boots in order to keep awake. Nothing happens till I am relieved. Only the everlasting roll over there. Gradually we grow calmer and play scat and poker continually. Perhaps we will be lucky. All day the sky is hung with observation balloons. There is a rumor that the enemy are going to put tank tanks over and use low-flying planes for the attack. But that interests us less than what we hear of the new flamethrowers. We wake up in the middle of the night. The earth booms. Heavy fire is falling on us. We crouch into corners. We distinguish shells of every caliber. Each man lays hold of his things and looks again every minute to reassure himself that they are still there. The dugout heaves. The night roars and flashes. We look at each other in the momentary flashes of light and with pale faces and pressed lips shake our heads. Every man is aware of the heavy shells tearing down the parapet, rooting up the embankment and demolishing the upper layers of concrete. When a shell lands in the trench, we note how the hollow, furious blast 
is like a blow from the paw of a raging beast of prey. Already by morning, a few of the recruits are green and vomiting. They are too inexperienced. Slowly the gray light trickles into the, po into the post and pales the flashes of the shells. Morning is come. The explosion of mines mingles with the gunfire. That is the most dementing invulsion of all. The whole region where they go up become, becomes one grave. The relief goes out. The observers stagger in, covered with dirt and trembling. One lies down in silence in the corner and eats. The other, an older man of the new draft, sobs. Twice he has been flung over the parapet by the blast of the explosions without getting any more than shell shock. The recruits are eyeing him. We must watch them. These things are catching. Already some lips begin to quiver. It is good that it is growing daylight. Perhaps the attack will come before noon. The bombardment does not diminish. It is falling in the rear, too. As far as one can see, spout fountains of mud and iron. A wide belt is being raked. Page 107. The attack does not come, but the bombardment continues. We are gradually benumbed. Hardly a man speaks. We cannot make ourselves understood. Our trench is almost gone. At many places, it is only 18 inches high. It is broken by holes and craters and mountains of earth. A shell lands square in front of our post. At once it is dark. We are buried and must dig ourselves out. After an hour, the entrance is clear again, and we are calmer because we have had something to do. Our company commander scrambles in and reports that two dugouts are gone. The recruits calm themselves when they see him. He says that an attempt will be made to bring up food this evening. That sounds reassuring. No one had thought of it except Chadden. Now the outside world seems a, to draw a little nearer. If food can be brought up, thinks the recruits, then it can't be really, really so bad. We do not disabuse them. We know that food is as important as ammunition and only for that reason must be brought up. But it miscarries. A second party goes out and it also turns back. Finally, Cat tries, and even he reappears without accomplishing anything. No... One gets through. Not even a fly is small enough to get through such a barrage. Page 108. We pull in our belts tighter and chew every mouthful three times as long. Still, the food does not last out. We are damnably... We are damnably hungry. I take out a scrap of bread, eat the white, and push the put the crust back in my knapsack. From time to time, I nibble at it. The night is unbearable. We cannot sleep, but stare ahead of us and doze. Chodden regrets that we wasted the gnawed pieces of bread on the rats. We would gladly have them again to eat now. We are short of water too, but not seriously yet. Towards morning, while it is still dark, there is some excitement. Through the entrance rushes in a swarm of fleeing rats that try to storm the walls. Torches light up the confusion. Everyone yells and curses and slaughters. The madness and despair of many hours unloads itself in this outburst. Faces are distorted, arms strike out, and the beasts scream. We just stop in time to avoid attacking one another. The onslaught has exhausted us. We lie down to wait again. It is a marvel that our post has no casualties so far. It is one of the less deep dugouts. A corporal creeps in. He has a loaf of bread with him. Three people have had the luck to get through during the night and bring some provisions. They say the bombardment extends undiminished as far as the artillery lines. It is a mystery where the enemy gets all his shells. Page 109. We wait and wait. By midday, what I expected happens. One of the recruits has a fit. I have been watching him for a long time, grinding his teeth and opening and shutting his fists. These hunted, protrude, protruding eyes, we know them too well. During the last few hours, he has had merely the appearance of calm. He had collapsed like a rotten tree. Now he stands up, stealthily creeps across the floor, hesitates a moment, then glides toward the door. I intercept him and say, where are you going? I'll be back, I'll be back in a minute, says he, and tries to push past me. Wait a bit, the shelling will stop soon. He listens for a moment, and his eyes become clear. Then again, he has the glowering eyes of a mad dog. He is silent. He shoves me aside. One minute, lad, I say. 
Cat notices. Just as the recruit shakes me off, Cat jumps in and we hold him. Then he begins to rave. Leave me alone. Let me go out. I will go out. He won't listen to anything and hits out. His mouth is wet and pours out half-choked, meaningless words. It is a case of claustrophobia. Oh, shoot. Sorry, excuse me. It is a case of claustrophobia. Page 110. He feels as though he is suffocating here and wants to get out at any price. If, he le if we let him go, he would run about everywhere, regardless of cover. He is not the first. Though he raves and his eyes roll, it can't be helped. We have to give him a hiding to bring him to his senses. We do it quickly and mercilessly, and at last he sits down quietly. The others have turned pale. Let's hope it deters them. This bombardment is too much for the poor devils. They have been sent straight from a recruiting depot into a barrage that is enough to turn an old soldier's hair gray. After this affair, the sticky, close atmosphere works more than ever on our nerves. We sit as if in our graves, awaiting only to be closed in. Suddenly it howls and flashes terrifically. The dugout cracks in all its joints under a direct hit. Fortunately, only a light one that the concrete blocks are able to withstand. It rings metallically. The walls reel, rifles, helmets, earth, mud, and dust fly everywhere. Sulfur fumes pour in. If we were one in one of those light dugouts that they have been building lately instead of this deeper one, none of us would be alive. But the effect is bad enough even so. The recruit starts to rave again and two others follow suit. One jumps up and rushes out. We have trouble with the other two. I start after one who escapes and wonder whether to shoot him in the leg. Then it shrieks again. I fling myself down, and when I stand up, the wall of the trench is plastered with smoking splinters, lumps of flesh, and bits of uniform. I scramble back. The first recruit seems actually to have gone insane. He butts his head against the wall like a goat. We must try tonight to take him to the rear. Meanwhile, we bind him but in such a way that in case of attack, he can be released at once. Cat suggests a game of scat. It is easier when a man has something to do, but it is no use. We listen for every explosion that comes close, miscounts the tricks, and fail to follow suit. We have to give it up. We sit as though in a baller, boiler that is being belabored from without on all sides. Night again. We are deadened by the strain, a deadly tension that scrapes along one's spine like a gaped knife. While our legs refuse to move, our hands tremble, our bodies are a thin skin stretched painfully over repressed madness, over an almost irresistible bursting roar. We have neither flesh nor muscles any longer. We dare not look at one another for fear of some miscalculable thing. So we shut our teeth. It will end. It will end. Perhaps we will come through. Suddenly the nearer explosions cease. The shelling continues, but it has lifted and falls behind us, our trenches free. We seize the hand grenades, pitch them out in front of the dugout, and jump after them. The bombardment has stopped, and a heavy barrage now follows behind us. The attack has come. Page 112. No one would believe that in this howling waste there could still be men, but steel helmets now appear on all sides of the trench. And 50 yards from us, a machine gun is already in position and barking. The wire entanglements are torn to pieces, yet they offer some obstacle. We see the stormtroops coming. Our artillery opens fire. Machine guns rattle. Rifles crack. The charge in works its way across. High and crop begin with the hand grenades. They throw as fast as they can. Others pass them. The handles with the strings already pulled. High throws 75 yards. Crop 60. It has been measured. The distance, the distance is important. The enemy, as they run, cannot do much before they are within 40 yards. We recognize the smooth, distorted faces, the helmets. They are French. They have offered, already suffered heavily when they reach the remnants of the barbed wire entanglements. A whole line has gone down before our machine guns. Then we have a lot of stoppages, and they come nearer. I see one of them, his face upturned, fall into a wire cradle. 
His body collapses. His hands remain suspended as though they were praying. Then his body drops clean away, and only his hands with the stumps of his arms shot off now hang in the wire. Page 113. The moment we are about to retreat, three faces rise up from the ground in front of us. Under one of the helmets, a dark pointed beard and two eyes that are fastened on me. I raise my hand, but I cannot throw into those strange eyes. For one mad moment, the whole slaughter whirls like a circus around me, and these two eyes alone are motionless. Then the head rises up, a hand of movement, and my hand grenade flies through the air and into him. We make for the rear pull wire cradles into the trench and leave bombs behind us with the strings pulled, which ensures us a fiery retreat. The machine guns are already firing from the next position. We have become wild beasts. We do not fight. We defend ourselves against annihilation. It is not against men that we fling our bombs. What do we know of men in this moment when death is hunting us down? Now for the first time in three days, we can see his face. Now for the first time in three days, we can oppose him. We feel a mad anger. No longer do we lie helpless, waiting on the scaffold. We can destroy and kill to save ourselves, to save ourselves and to be revenged. We crouch behind every corner, behind every barrier of barbed wire and hurl heaps of explosives. Page 114. At the feet of the advancing enemy before we run, the blast of the hand grenade impinges powerfully on our arms and legs, crouching like cats. We run on, overwhelmed by this wave that bears us along, that fills us with ferocity, turns us into thugs, into murderers, into God only knows what devils this wave that multiples our, multiplies our strength with fear and madness and greed of life, seeking and fighting for nothing but our deliverance. If your own father came over with them, you would not hesitate to fling a bomb at him. The forward trenches have been abandoned. Are they still trenches? They are blown to pieces, annihilated. There are only broken bits of trenches, holes linked by cracks, nests of craters. That is all. But the enemy's casualties increase. They did not count on so much resistance. Page 114. It is nearly noon. The sun blazes hotly. The sweat stings in our eyes. We wipe it off on our sleeves and often blood with it. At last, we reach a trench that is in somewhat better condition. It is manned and ready for the counterattack. It receives us. Our guns open in full blast and cut off the enemy attack. The lines behind us stop. They can advance no farther. The attack is crushed by our artillery. We watch. The fire lifts a hundred yards and we break forward. Beside me, a lance corporal has his head torn off. He runs a few steps more while the blood spouts from his neck like a fountain. It does not come quite to hand-to-hand -to -hand fighting. They are driven back. We arrive once again at our shattered trench and pass on beyond it. Oh, this turning back again. We reach the shelter of the reserves and yearn to creep in and disappear, but instead we must turn round and plunge again into the horror. If we were not automata, at that moment we would continue lying there, exhausted and without will, but we are swept forward again, powerless, madly savage and raging. We will kill, for they are still our mortal enemies. Their rifles and bombs are aimed against us, and if we do not destroy them, they will destroy us. The brown earth, the torn, blasted earth with the greasy shine under the sun's rays. The earth is the background of this restless, gloomy world of automatons. Our gasping is the scratching of a quill. Our lips are dry. Our heads are debauched with stupor. Thus we stagger forward, and into our pierced and shattered souls bores the torturing image of the brown earth with the greasy sun and the convulsed and dead soldiers who lie there, it can't be helped, who cry and clutch at our legs as we spring away over them. Page 116. We have lost all feeling for one another. We can hardly control ourselves when our glance lights on the form of some other man. We are insensible, dead men, who through some trick, some dreadful magic, are still able to run and to kill. A young Frenchman lags behind. He is overtaken. He puts his hand up. In one, he still holds his revolver. 
Does he mean to shoot or to give himself? A blow from a spade cleaves through his face. A second sees it and tries to run farther. A bayonet jabs into his back. He leaps in the air, his arms thrown wide, his mouth wide open, yelling. He staggers in his back, the bayonet quivers. A third throws away his rifle, covers de- cowers down with his hands before his eyes. He is left behind with a few other prisoners to carry off the wounded. Suddenly in the pursuit we reach the enemy line. We are so close on the heels of our retreating enemies that we reach it almost at the same time as they. In this way we suffer few casualties. A machine gun barks, but it is silence with a bomb. Nevertheless, the couple of seconds has sufficed to give us five stomach wounds. With the butt of his rifle, Cat smashes to pulp the face of one of the unwounded machine gunners. We bayonet the others before they have time to get out their bombs. Then thirstily, we drink the water they have for cooling the gun. Everywhere, wire cutters are snapping. Planks are thrown across the entanglements. We jump through the narrow entrances into the trenches. High strikes his spade into the neck of a gigantic Frenchman and throws the first hand grenade. We duck behind a breastwork for a few seconds. Then the straight hit of a bit of trench ahead of us is empty. The next throw whizzes obliquely over the corner and clears a passage. As we run past, we toss handfuls down into the dugouts. The earth shudders. It crashes, smokes, and groans. We stumble over slippery lumps of flesh, over yielding bodies. I fall into an open belly on which lies a clean new officer's cap. The fight ceases. We lose touch with the enemy. We cannot stay here long, but must retire under cover of our artillery to our own position. No sooner do we know this than we dive into the nearest dugout, and with the utmost haste seize on whatever provisions we can see, especially the tins of corned beef and butter, before we clear out. We get back pretty well. There is no further attack by the enemy. We lie for an hour, panting and resting before anyone speaks. We are so completely played out that in spite of our great hunger, we do not think of the provisions. Page 118. Then gradually, we become something like men again. The corned beef over there is famous along the whole front. Occasionally, it has been the chief reason for a flying raid on our part for our nourishment is generally very bad. We have a constant hunger. We bagged five tins altogether. The fellows over there are well looked after. They fare magnificently, as against us poor starving wretches, with our turnip jam. They can get all the meat they want. High has scored a thin loaf of white French bread and stuck it behind his belt like a spade. It is a bit bloody at one corner, but that can be cut off. It is a good thing we have something decent to eat at last. We still have a use for all our strength. Enough to eat is just as vali- is just as valuable as a good dugout. It can save our lives. That is the reason we are so greedy for it. Chaudan has captured two water bottles full of cognac. We pass them around. The evening benediction begins. Night comes. Out of the craters rise the mists. It looks as though the holes were, ver- were full of ghostly secrets. The white vapor creeps painfully round before it ventures to steal away over the edge. Then long streaks stretch from crater to crater. Page 119. It is chilly. I am on sentry and stare into the darkness. My strength is exhausted, as always after an attack, and so it is hard for me to be alone with my thoughts. They are not properly thoughts. They are memories which in my weakness haunt me and strangely move me. The parachute, light soar, the parachute lights soar upwards, and I see a picture, a summer evening. I am in the cathedral cloister and look at the tall rose trees that bloom in the middle of the light cloister garden are the stone carvings of the stations of the cross. No one is there. A great quietness rules in those, this blossoming quadrangle. The sun lies warm on the heavy gray stones. I place my hand upon them and feel the warmth. At the right-hand corner of the green cathedral spire ascends into the pale blue sky of the evening. Between the glowing columns of the cloister is the cool darkness that only churches have, and I stand there and wonder whether, when I am twenty, I shall have experienced the bewildering emotions of love. The image is alarmingly near. It touches me before it dissolves in the light of the next star shell. 
I lay hold of my rifle to see that it is the trib. Page 120. The barrel is wet. I take it in my hands and rub off the moisture with my fingers. Between the meadows behind our town, there stands a line of old poplars by a stream. They were visible from a great distance, and although they grew on one bank only, we called them the Poplar Avenue. Even as children, we had a great love for them. They drew us vaguely thither. We played truant the whole day by them and listened to their rustling. We sat beneath them on the bank of the stream and let our feet hang in the bright, swift waters. The pure fragrance of the water and the melody of the wind in the poplars held our fancies. We loved them dearly, and the image of those days still makes my heart pause in its beating. It is strange that all the memories that come have these two qualities. They are always completely calm, that is predominant in them, and even if they are not really calm, they become so. They are soundless apparitions that speak to me with looks and gestures silently, without any word, and it is the alarm of their silence that forces me to lay hold of my sleeve and my rifle, lest I should abandon myself to the liberation and allurement in which my body would dilate and gently pass away into the still forces that lie behind these things. They are quiet in this way because quietness is so unattainable for us now. And at the front there is no quietness, and the curse of the front reaches so far that we pass beyond it. Even in the remote depots and the rest areas, the droning and the muffled noise of shelling is always in our ears. We are never so far off that it is no more to be heard. But these last few days it has been unbearable. Page 121. Their stillness is the reason why these memories of former times do not awaken desire so much as sorrow, a vast, imprehensible melancholy. Once we had such desires, but they return not. They are past. They belong to another world that is gone from us. In the barracks, in the barracks, they called forth a rebellious, wild craving for their return. For when they were still bound to us, we belonged to them and they to us, even though we were already absent from them. They appeared in the soldiers' songs, which we sang as we marched between the glow of the dawn and the black silhouette of the forests to drill on the moor. They were a powerful remembrance that was in us and came from us. But here in the trenches, they are completely lost to us. They arise no more. We are dead, and they stand remote on the horizon. They are a mysterious reflection, an apparition they, that haunts us, that we fear and love without hope. They are strong, and our desire is strong, but they are unattainable, and we know it. Page 122. And if these scenes of our youth were given back to us, we would hardly know what to do. The tender secret influence that passed from them into us could not rise again. We might be amongst them and move in them. We might remember and love them and be stirred by the sight of them, but it would be like gazing at the photograph of a dead comrade. Those are his features. It is his face, and the days we spent together take on a mournful life in the memory, but the man himself it is not. We could never regain the old intimacy with, the, with those scenes. It was not any recognition of their beauty and their significance that attracted us, but the communion, the feeling of a comradeship with the things and events of, of our existence, which cuts us off and made the world of our parents a thing incomprehensible to us. For then we surrendered ourselves to events and were lost in them, and the least little thing was enough to carry us down the stream of eternity. Perhaps it was only the privilege of our youth, but as yet we recognized no limits and saw nowhere to an end. But we had the thrill, that thrill of expectation in the blood which united us with the course of our days. Today we would pass through the scenes of our youth like travelers. We are burnt up by hard facts. Like tradesmen, we understand distinctions and like butchers' necessities. We are no longer untroubled. We are different. We might exist there. But should we really live there? We are forlorn. We are forlorn like children and experienced like old men. We are crude and sorrowful and superficial. 
I believe we are lost.